okay. All right, is the lighting okay? Or you want it dimmer or lighter? You're okay? All right. Okay, well, once again, thank you very much. And that's what I meant about sort of uh, giving a lecture like a love affair. Sometimes it has ups and downs, but anyway. So, um, okay, so we're going to be talking about stem cells today uh, and their uh, use in uh, treating uh, various conditions. Okay, we um, are the uh, Mississippi Stem Cell Treatment Center and we are um, affiliated <coughs> with the uh, Cell Surgical Network and the uh, California Stem Cell Treatment uh, Center. The Cell Surgical Network was the first to study adipose-derived uh, um, uh, stem cells uh, under IRB-approved uh, research protocols, and these are the Institutional Review Board, so they are really important. And the California Stem Cell Treatment Center um, developed customized equipment to use in harvesting uh, stem cells and processing and giving back to patients. So why the excitement about stem cells? Well, we, on average, um, destroy and uh, repair, as you can see, 1.7 million cells every minute. That's every minute. That's a lot of cells. And every hour, that goes to over 1 billion cells. So if we cannot replace those, then obviously we, we die in a very, very short time. So some authorities say we possibly age as a result of not being able to replace those cells that die with time. And that's why we age and uh, eventually die. <coughs> so we spoke about regenerative medicine. What is regenerative medicine? Regenerative medicine is uh, medicine that uses stem cells and growth factors together uh, to repair and or replace tissues that have been damaged or uh, lost or even congenital uh, defects. It recreates living uh, functional tissues and uh, uh, it would stimulate pre uh, previously irreparable organs to heal themselves, which is uh, very exciting. So what is a stem cell? Well, there are two requirements for being a stem cell. First of all, it must be able to replicate, divide, and the other one, differentiate. These two are extremely important two functions of a stem cell. So in that first picture at the top, you can see all the cells are the same. They're dividing like mad. It takes about four cells to divide to form a new cell. And then in the next four pictures down here, you can see the differentiation. So there is division, and then there is differentiation into fat, bone, cartilage, muscle, and everything else. So this is a <coughs> um, stem cell of a uh, uh, mouse. Some cells have been uh, dyed with fluorescent dye to show them up. And this is a colony of human uh, stem cells grown in feeder cells from a mouse, fi fibroblasts. So from that, you could conclude that there are two uh, sources of stem cells, either embryonic from a fetus or from adults. We call them adult mesenchymal stem cells. The embryonic stem cells are obviously from a fetus. And they are multi multipotential. They can produce any. Um, type of cell in the entire body. But when used for therapy, there are moral and ethical issues um, associated with that. And we all know during the Bush administration when they began to talk about that and um, you know there were two lobbies, one for and one against. And then one of the issues about them is that they tend to be um, got from leftover uh, fertilized uh, eggs, and, and that raises issues. And of course, you know, when human uh, fetuses are aborted, embryos, uh, they, they used to take those cells. Now, they have problems also because they have a different DNA from the recipient, that's the patient, 
And of course, there is potential rejection. And um, also, they have a potential for forming tumors. Okay, and these um, are usually of the teratoma type. In other words, they have all uh, different kinds of cells in them. So this is a <clears throat> an artist's sort of impression of the uh, fertilized egg, and then it divides into two, four, eight, and so on. And then it forms a blastula, and, and those cells of the blastula are multipotential. They're just stem cells, basically, and they can produce anything. So depending on the environment that they find themselves into, that they start producing the cells. So they can produce uh, you know, cardiac muscle, blood cells, you name it. On the other hand, the adult uh, stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells, are found all over our bodies. They are multipotent, uh, and they are found in the bone marrow, in fat, and everywhere else, in fact. But the ones in the bone marrow were the classical ones that uh, everybody thought that they are the ones that, uh, the only ones existed as stem cells, until we found out that they exist everywhere else. And <clears throat> The ones in the bone marrow, they keep producing a trickle of cells to replace the destroyed red blood cells and white blood cells. Now, it's important to realize that, I mean, most people know that a red cell lives about 120 days in the circulation, and it dies. It's destroyed by the spleen. Now, a white cell lives only about 12 hours. And that's a very, very short time. Now, all those need to be replaced. And there's a continual trickle uh, of those um, stem cells to replace those uh, cells that have been destroyed. So when, they are, when these are used for therapy, there are no moral issues, because we're taking them from the same person, giving them back to the same person. And there is no potential for rejection, because they have the same DNA as the host. Okay, so they can differentiate into all cells of the body, you name it. Now, the important, it's important to um, um, remember that some authorities think that the stem cells found all over the body, especially the ones in fat, are colonies from the original ones in bone marrow, because they have, they have lots of similarities, but they do have slight differences also. But in the <clears throat> Adult, there are two sources. You can either take them from the same person, give them back to the same person, or you can take them from one person, give them to another one. So if you take them from one person, give them to another one, we call that allogeneic, okay, from another human being. And that has a potential for rejection and for infection because it's a different DNA. Whereas when we're talking about the autog uh, autogenous ones, from the same person, giving back to the same person, there are no issues, moral, no rejection, and very, very low risk of uh, bacterial or viral infection, very low risk, hardly any. So, in each human, there are sort of different sites that we can get the cells out of. Bone marrow is the traditional one, but surprisingly, it doesn't have an awful lot of stem cells, contrary to what uh, I used to think when I was a medical student. Now, only one in every 20,000 cells is a stem cell. Whereas, in fact, there is a lot more. And other tissues, they contain low numbers, including uh, umbilical cord and uh, you know, spleen and liver and all those. So the bone marrow stem cells are easy to harvest under local anesthesia, and that's called a marrow aspirate. Now, they, we can get up to about 20,000 uh, stem cells per mil, and that might sound a lot, but it's not, because for a therapeutic result, we need more than that. So we need to culture them for a few days or a few weeks to increase their numbers. We need to get the numbers up to about two or three million to effect a good result therapeutically. So 
patients need to return a few days later or a few weeks later for the treatment to be completed. Now, anecdotally, there are many good, good reports about those um, patients who have received bone marrow uh, stem cells. There are good results obtained with them. But there are FDA issues, and we need to get approval for FDA for that, because the FDA will come into it if there is a drug issue, and that is a drug issue if you start culturing the cells in a, in a lab and giving them several days, giving, giving them back several days later. So then the FDA would be very interested in getting in, and that's why a lot of those have been done abroad where there is no FDA jurisdiction. So, also there's something else about the bone marrow stem cells. Initially at birth, one in every 10,000 is a stem cell. But shortly after that, they begin to dwindle in, in, in numbers. And by the age of 80, there is one, only one in every two million, which is a stem cell. And that's not an awful lot. The adipose stem cells, on the other hand, the fat ones, we can harvest also under local anesthesia by liposuction, which is a little easier than uh, attacking the bone marrow. And on average, we get well over half a million cells per mil of fat. And we can generally harvest a minimum of 25 uh, milliliters of fat from even the thinnest of people. And of course, most, most people want us to take a lot more <laughs> than, than, than simply a, uh, a handful. So um, we can get a yield of well over 10 million very, very easily, million cells. So harvesting, pre uh, preparing, and deploying takes only a couple of hours, at most three hours. So also, it's less expensive than doing a bone marrow um, aspirate because bone marrow aspirate, as we said earlier, you have to culture the cells to increase the numbers. So that costs money. So it's, 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 um, it's a lot cheaper to do the uh, fat uh, stem cells and also requires less experience because it requires a lot more experience to get the bone marrow aspirate and also to culture. You need the facility. So there's a lot of research going on about the stem cells produced from um, fat. And in fact, there is a good um, company out of California called Cytori, and you can look it up on the internet. And they've done some research on people with myocardial infarction. They found out that, in fact, if you uh, give people who've had a myocardial infarction stem cells, they fare better than if you do not very early on. So the adipose-derived stem cells initially are very, very high at birth, but then they, in the second decade, they come down, but they maintain the numbers well into uh, old age. I'm not saying that 60 is old age, but nonetheless. <laughs> now, the important thing also, the graph on the right side shows that their viability is also maintained, whereas the viability in the stem cells out of the marrow goes down with age. So those, the viability is maintained at about well over 80%. So how do stem cells work? We've heard a lot about stem cells. How do they work? Well, they're, they're dormant in the tissues if there is no damage or injury. They respond to tissue degeneration, injury, inflammation, or death, cell death. And they have this interesting phenomenon of homing in on areas of trouble, just like the police. And like white cells, when you get an injury in your finger, for example, infection, it swells up and there's a lot of white cells there because they, they home in on this. And those cells have the same kind of property. Now, when the cells go there, they may turn into any needed tissue. And the stem cells may provide also messaging through 
growth factors and cytokines to repair damaged cells. Now, it, it, this all adds up to, what, not only stem cells, but soup, containing stem cells and growth factors and cytokines and other things we don't know. But we found that it's all very beneficial. So this soup we call stromal vascular fraction, which is, as I said, uh, uh, composed of stem cells, several known growth factors, and a growth factor is a polypeptide, a protein, which signals an action to the cell. And there are probably several unknown growth factors which we'll be discovering with time. So the property of this soup is that it's regenerative, it's anti-inflammatory, it's immunomodulatory. So when it's injected into joints, just like steroid, it has a lot of benefit. So the stromal vascular fraction, or SVF, is what we deploy at our facility, Mississippi Stem Cell Treatment Center, and also what is deployed in the centers affiliated with the cell surgical network that we belong to. It's also the same stuff which is deployed in Japan, Germany, uh, Russia, and uh, Korea. So the stem cell, uh, the, the cell, cell uh, the, 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 the um, uh, SVF is part of the fat which is rich in adult mesenchymal stem cells and natural growth factors and cytokines. So what are the advantages of, gi of giving SVF as a source of stem cells over stem cells, purified stem cells by themselves, isolated? Well, for starters, we get much, much higher yield, which we need for the therapeutic uh, dose. It's very safe. It's, it's autogenous. We take it on the same patient, own cells, give it back, no risk of, the, uh, of, of rejection or uh, disease being transferred. They're, they're very versatile. They're, they have a wide spectrum of action because of the growth factors as well as the stem cells. And um, they're anti-inflammatory, regenerative, and they do everything. And there are no ethical issues attached to this because we're not using embryos, you're using your own cells. They're easy to obtain, simple procedure, and potentially all those half million liposuctions taking place every year throughout the United States, that fat can be saved if and when the um, organization is complete with regard to that so that for the same person, years down the road, they can use them if they're frozen. So why inject ad additional stem cells since we said earlier that we do have our own stem cells uh, present and uh, they are dormant, or they need to be, uh, is to be woken up. Well, there is this phenomenon of bioavailability, and the dorm dormant cells, dormant cells need to be woken up, and they, they need to be made available to the damaged tissues. And the numbers in most areas are not are not high, so that you know when you inject more, then that spurs them into action. So when additional stem cells and growth factors are added to tissues in large numbers, then they can affect a the therapeutic um, uh, change. They do exert local as well as systemic properties, so that if you give um, the stuff intravenously, then you do see effects everywhere. So it's not only because of stem cells, but probably because of the uh, growth factors and the cytokines. This is a very, very interesting um, couple of pictures here, and they show some interesting stuff. Now, this is a gamma camera whole body scan of a patient with cerebellar atrophy, cerebellar atrophy. And they have been given the stem cells tagged with technetium-99 for the radioactive tracing so that we can trace them. You can see how here they've gone to the head of the right femur, the right hip joint, because there is a problem there. They didn't go to the left side. Okay, so that's very, very interesting. Now, the other interesting thing is that they 
they home in on the liver and on the lungs. So that when you give them intravenously, they pass through the lungs, obviously, initially before they go everywhere else. And some of them stay in the lungs for a while, hence the treatment of COPD um, with them. So what about fat? Fat, I mean, we, we heard a lot about fat. So fat, one gram of fat on average contains four million cells. One million of those are adipocytes, fat cells. One million is stem cells, and one million is vascular endothelial cells, and one million other stuff. And this came from a paper whose reference is out there, if anybody's interested. So the adipose stem cells can multiply and change into additional fat cells when challenged by you know, somebody becoming a little overweight. And if the weight remains stable, then those cells will remain dormant until they're needed. So we believe that stem cells live up to about you know, 10 years, perhaps. And the stem cells, when they're separated from fat, as we, as we do when we uh, use them, then they are basically stem cells. OK, so how do we prepare the uh, stromal vascular fraction? Uh, for treatment, okay? First of all, we harvest the fat from either the belly or from the thigh under local anesthesia. Then we centrifuge the fat to concentrate it. We add an enzyme to uh, digest the attachment between the cells, collagen. And then we remove that soup, SVF, uh, which contains the growth factors and the uh, uh, stem cells. We wash out the collagenase. It's very important to do that to conform with FDA regulations. And then we uh, deploy what we have in our hand. So how do we uh, prepare it? It's very important to have this syringe. It's a uh, single-use syringe. It's very expensive. It's made by this uh, company in South Korea. And it has a weighted metallic piston, a microfilter, and a fluid gate. So this is uh, a picture with the same syringe, uh, full of fat from somebody's belly. OK, it was a mini liposuction. It's a completely closed system. And we use the techniques of uh, uh, Drs. Lee and uh, Yoshimura. Yoshimura is from Japan, and Lee from South Korea. And it's a completely sterile procedure. OK, and we can take it out of the thigh. This is somebody's thigh. OK, the head's over there, and this is the thigh. So we can take it from anywhere. We put it in the centrifuge. And this was designed especially in South Korea. Um, as you can see, it's called LipoKit. And it has a port for suction as well, so we can use it to do liposuction. And you can see the, uh, this is what we get out from the patient, the lipid, the fat. That's 24, 24 karat gold. And then we put it in the centrifuge, and that separates into three layers. And that's the piston we mentioned earlier. Now, this is the fat here, and this is the infranatant, and that's literally liquid oil, just like one you buy uh, to cook with. So we decant that to start with, then we get rid of that, and we use the fat, and then we add enzyme to it. Incubate it, then separate the fat from the uh, uh, stem cell mix, the soup, wash it, and that's what we get, OK? So that's what we get. So this is it. So now we have the liquid in our hand. What do we do with it? Well, we've got to first of all find out exactly how many cells there are in it. So we need to know the quantity and the quality, the viability of those cells. So for that, we use a counting system, which is called the Countess Cell Counter made by this company here. It's simple. It provides cell counts. 
and uses uh, a dye, tripan, uh, uh, tripan blue, to determine the viability. And you'll see in a minute how. So it can we can also select the size that we count. And the size of those little beasts is about 15 uh, 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 microns. So we set the parameters between, between uh, 10 and 60 so that we catch those cells. And of course, you know, we can't help it, but sometimes we do count some white blood cells, but we think we probably eliminate most of the red cells. Okay, so this is the, the counter. We put the slide there with a drop of that stuff and the dye. And this is what we see. You can see the, the good cells are here. These are the ones that we need. These are the ones with the halo. The ones that are stained gold all over are dead cells. Now, why does that happen? Because the, the dye cannot penetrate a viable cell. If a cell is living, the dye will not go inside. So it, it stains as a halo around the cell. Whereas the dead cells, uh, in the dead cells, the dye penetrates deep. Okay, so now that we have it in our hands, how do we use it? Well, we can go, go with direct injection into the joints, the simple joints like the knee, it's right there. We can stab it, there's no problem with that. Of course, under uh, local anesthesia and uh, uh, sterile conditions. Now, knee and the shoulder are easy to do. The more difficult joints, deep areas, like the spine, the neck, then we like to have a CT or magnetic resonance with dye, so that we know the active areas that need to be treated, and then we inject those areas. So we do it with contrast enhancement, so that those areas will light up that need to be treated. And then they are injected under fluoroscopy or CT guidance. All right, now for places like the hip joint and the shoulder joint in people who are overweight, we can use ultrasound to locate the area well. Or, you know, sometimes we can send them for the um, CT guided injection. In everybody, <clears throat> we do an intravenous injection with a surplus. From what I said earlier, we have this homing in property, which is very, very important that we try and make full use of that. So that we inject a little into the joint that is giving the problem, say a couple of milliliters, and what remains is about six or seven milliliters, and that contains about 40 or 50 million cells we inject that into the circulation through a filter. So in people with peripheral vascular disease and ulcers in the legs that do not heal, then we can inject directly into those areas. And uh, about seven out of 10 people who would have gone to amputation, don't need amputation anymore because of that. Now, Rarely, if ever, we can inject into the CSF, central, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and rarely into arteries and directly into the eye. But of course, to do that, you need an ophthalmologist. So, <clears throat> what does this stuff do? We already said that before, it's regenerative and inflammatory and immunomodulatory. And the stem cells in the soup will do their job. And there are several known and unknown uh, uh, growth factors and cytokines that will also help out. Just to mention uh, on the side, you know, with peripheral arterial disease, with people who have total occlusion of arteries that have not been able to benefit from bypasses or endovascular procedures, they've reached the end of the line, then in those, 
when we inject the stuff, they actually develop new vessels. And as I mentioned earlier, seven out of 10 will not need amputations anymore. So, <clears throat> eventually we're going to have to grow some of those cells because demand will probably increase. It'll probably increase exponentially over the next few years. And we already have one medical board, the Texas Medical Board, that has actually sanctioned, they allowed um, the, the, the use of stem cells. So at least one board in the United States has now allowed stem cells to uh, be used, basically, legally. Okay. So eventually I can see, I can foresee that lots of people will donate their uh, fat, and that goes into a stem cell bank. And if they do have a problem, develop a problem later on in life, they can probably get back. So what can stem cells be used for? Well, there's a nice list there of almost everything in the body that you can use them, the stem cells for. OK, we we'll start with some orthopedics here. And you can see the, uh, that you can use them for spinal and arthritic joints, chronic backs, shoulders, even sports injuries, tendons and ligaments. And uh, they work wonders with those. Most of the orthopedic issues are knees that we deal with. And there's a bunch of patients in our group in California who had chronic resting pain. And they had all been scheduled for total knee replacements. And they were given the. Um, SVF, and most of them got relief from breast pain. They showed significant improvement on standing, and the pain improved on ambulation. And most of them did not need any knee replacements anymore. The best results are obtained in trauma and osteoarthrosis. Less good results are obtained with rheumatoid arthritis. This is an example of uh, a pair of knees. On the left side, you can see the medial uh, condyle. That space is gone. That gentleman received SVF. And four months later, you can see a space there. That's the same name. Watch the same name. And these are the two side by side. You can see there's definite improvement there in that knee. And this is the Womack scale from Canada, which talks about pain, stiffness, and function. And you can see there's definite improvement in all three. What about the cardiopulmonary diseases? Okay, all those diseases can be treated, but not pulmonary fibrosis. Asthma. There's a report of two uh, ladies from Shanghai at uh, WA Hospital there, and they use the max stem technique, which we use. And they're both treated with IV uh, SVF. One was 45 and one was 48, and they both had asthma with chronic cough, interfering with their lives, with their sleep, they had nasal congestion. Now, after 24 hours of receiving the treatment, they felt better, less cough, they slept through the night, and their sinuses cleared up. Now, six weeks later, both reported they had felt 75% better. What about COPD? Well, there are four patients treated in um, uh, California by one of my colleagues, and they had moderate improvement. They both were given, um, they, they were all given uh, IV and nebulizer uh, with stem cells. One, one of them had been told that he had one month to live in November 2011, and he was last heard of in March 2012, and he was still alive and 
what's more important, he was going out without oxygen. So <clears throat> the cardiopulmonary uh, issue, there's this uh, lady whom, uh, who works very close to uh, our um, uh, site in California, Rancho Mirage, and she was an avid equestrian. She didn't have any stamina, and she could not ride for more than an hour or so before she was petered out. And she, had, she was very, very short of breath. She had IV uh, SVF, and three weeks uh, later, she felt much better. She was able to walk out, to work out at the gym, and do cardio exercises for extended periods. And she went back on the horse, and now you can get her off the saddle. Urology, well, those are the four conditions that respond well, it seems, uh, to um, this treatment. And uh, seven patients, as of January 2012, were treated, and the results were reasonably successful. In Peroni's disease, eight uh, cases, um, Dr. Lander, who is the uh, urologist in California, treated and uh, he gave direct injection into the penis there, and he broke up the scar, and he had moderate improvement. The interstitial cystitis, there were five patients in his series, and there was less pain and less discomfort, but they still had the urge to urinate uh, frequently. In renal insufficiency, there were four cases, and there was significant improvement in the leak of um, albumin in the urine. So the male incomp uh, uh, incontinence is also important, and um, we tend to use the Japanese protocol in our group, and um, they do direct. We obviously need the urolog uh, urologist for that. I wouldn't be doing it myself. Um, there is injection directly into the sphincter, uh, with, uh, mixed with, uh, with the fat itself. And the injection is done under local anesthesia. There is a study out of Austria in 2006, and they had 130 uh, patients, uh, 45 men and uh, 85 women with incontinence. They used the myoblast, uh, the stem cells out of muscle. 111 were cured, and 17 were more improved. So in men, the success was about 73%. So there were a couple of early successes also, uh, and these are the references uh, for them, uh, for uh, stress incontinence uh, in people who've had a, ra a radical prostatectomy. This is obviously more important for men than women. Okay, what about the autoimmune disease? And I know many people have autoimmune disease uh, around, and there's a very handsome list that um, seems to uh, respond in to varying, de varying degrees uh, to this treatment. And neurology, the same. There's a nice long list of conditions that would respond. So let's uh, talk about a couple of uh, examples here. Um, there was this uh, patient, uh, 44 years of age, male, with chronic inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyneuropathy. He couldn't walk. Uh, he couldn't think clearly. Um, he slept until uh, after uh, noon uh, every day. He had diarrhea and uh, he really was in bad shape. He had uh, SVF intravenously and four weeks later he noted the following improvements as you can see in that list. He began to wake up early. He began to write again. He moved around better with less weakness and he had normal bowel movement. His own doctor, primary doctor, said it was miraculous, better than when we started treat, uh, treatment a year before. So um, multiple sclerosis is important. I know many people um, in Mississippi have that, and uh, it is a crippling disease later on. And this lady of uh, uh, 54, she had had it for nine years, with progressive history, and she needed assistance walking and traveling. One week after the first injection, she drove and walked without any assistance. The second treatment, 
seem to maintain that good improvement. And there was another lady of 48. Um, she had two treatment, and she had um, the same kind of benefit. So the optic neuritis, um, we've had a good success with this lady. Uh, she um, was nearly blind on 40 milligrams of prednisone daily. She was, um, from the outset, she was told by Dr. Berman, uh, one of my colleagues in California, that he would give her a treatment every month. And uh, after the first treatment, the prednisone reduced to 30 milligrams from 40. And her visual field improved. And uh, it had always gone worse before, progressively worse. Now it seems to hold and even improve. After the second treatment, she had more improvement of vision, and the prednisone went down to 20 uh, milligrams a day. And the third treatment, the vision improved even more, and she was weaning off prednisone down to five uh, milligrams every other day. Dr. Berman saw her um, in uh, March uh, uh, 2012, and uh, you can see that her vision had reached 20 over 40 in both eyes, whereas before it had been 20 over 150. She had significant um, peripheral loss on both sides, which made it very difficult for her to drive anyway. She, um, by that time, was down to five milligrams every other day, and um, uh, Dr. Berman made a comment that you know he had the hard data if anybody wanted them uh, when I saw him last. So um, her ophthalmologist, who had been treating her, uh, made that, that comment uh, that, he, that that was the most important movement he'd ever uh, seen. And this is a, an interesting uh, note written by her daughter. Thank you for allowing my mom to watch me. <laughs> OK. So there are two other conditions there that would respond in the eye that would respond to this uh, kind of treatment, retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration. What about the cosmetic, cosmetic side? I know some people are interested in uh, looking, looking good and looking better. Okay, so fortified fat, fortified, in other words, you add, you make it stronger by adding those stem cells to it, and that will increase the survival ability of those uh, cells. Transferring cells, uh, uh, fat cells, just like doing a graft, and the graft needs a blood supply to be able to survive. And very often, uh, those cells do not survive. So mixing them with stem cells will increase the viability. You may be able to, to, to use uh, uh, stem cells to grow hair, and we may be able to um, uh, in, in improve the uh, skin quality by injecting the stem cells as well. And um, of course, we can delay aging, but we're not very sure about that yet, but I think that would, would probably come in the future. So fat grafting, according to uh, Yoshimura, who probably has done more work on this than anybody else uh, in Japan, and his... Uh, idea is that sort of host, the, the, the host where you transfer the fat to, uh, whether it be in the same person or another person, is low in oxygen. So the graft cells, the fat graft cells, will suffer hypoxia, little oxygen, and they will tend to die within 24 hours if not oxygenated. Stem cells, on the other hand, live at least uh, 72 hours. They are much more resilient. And in that space of time, they are um, able to produce more blood cell, uh, more more uh, 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 blood vessels, tiny blood vessels, which can actually bring a blood supply to those cells. We call that angiogenic. And Yoshimura made a comment that most cells, most, most fat cells die after injection, and stem cells replace the injured fat cells as well. So, so, so on the one hand, it does increase the blood supply. On the other hand, it will uh, uh, 
give a supply of more fat cells. So this is a uh, pictorial depiction of what he said. So if we take the fat and just transfer it by itself, it's less likely to survive than if you mix it with uh, another load of uh, stem cells and uh, growth factors. So the new, the new vessels will tend to form a lot more quickly. And this is uh, one uh, patient, in fact, this is from Dr. Berman, he did that. And you can see definite improvement there. And this is another lady with definite improvement for before and after. And this is for growing hair also. That's uh, before and after, before and after. You can see it's quite significant improvement. So there are other conditions that we have not spoken about because of shortage of time. But of course, uh, critical limb ischemia, uh, the one I touched, touched on earlier, is very, very important. Wind care is really important. I've seen patients who've had uh, ulcers for uh, you know, months and months and years and they will not heal. Well, if we can rule out any other uh, causes why they're not healing, then stem cells and SVF is what they need to make them improve. And of course, there are other conditions, including aging, which everybody seems to be afflicted with. All right, now what about the adverse effects? Everybody now wants to know about, okay, we've heard the good side, what about the bad side? Well, the bad side really is, 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 is non-existent. The only problem is that when we're doing the uh, uh, um, liposuction, and that's why we need to make sure that people are not on uh, Coumadin or um, aspirin, things like that, that would encourage hematoma formation at the site of liposuction. And in, in any case, we're not taking out a huge amount, so the cavity is very small, and we do it on the local anesthesia. Infection is, is very, very, very rare. Um, in fact, in our, in our entire uh, group, there have been very, very few. And in the group throughout the world, uh, the reported is less than 2%. So, um, how many treatments does one need? Well, it depends on the condition. As you saw earlier in some of the neurological um, uh, ophthalmic neuritis, you may need one every month for maybe, uh, you know, to see how, how, how the patient responds and then take it from there. Some conditions only require one treatment. Okay, who are not candidates? Well, those who have active cancer, infection, and on, on blood thinners until, of course, they stop the blood thinner and things improve. Are they FDA regulated? No. The conditions for FDA regulation is, is that if you're using your own cells and provide the entire service during the same surgical procedure and you minimally manipulate the cells, in other words, you don't grow them, you don't do these things with them, and you're not making unfounded claims, and it is a surgical procedure rather than a drug. So then in that case, it's not subject to FDA regulations. And these are educational websites. Okay, thank you very much.